today we are going to stress test uh, Cerberus. We are going to put it through its paces and make it uh, have as much difficulty <laughs> as possible. Now, when we are designing a new processor, uh, the kind of applications we want to stress test a processor are the applications that exercise the ALU, all the logic and arithmetic operations, all the control uh, 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 operations of the processor. Technically, we say that we want to uh, stress the data path and the control path inside the processor. But when we are designing a computer using already tried and proven uh, CPUs, then it's a different kind of applications that we want to, to, to stress test the computer. We want applications that get all the different components of the computer to talk to each other as much as possible to test the communication and synchronization protocols between them. In other words, we want applications that put a lot of stress on the buses and both the data bus and the address bus and also on the control nexus uh, of servers. So you want applications that write and read a lot from and to all the memories and that require synchronization. Uh, so that's what I went looking for to stress test Cerberus. I thought first of using a game like this little game, uh, Chicken Shooter, <laughs> that you see here. I, if I remember the, the keys to press, I could play it. Uh, there we go, M is to shoot. And then I can move it around. It's a very simple assembly written uh, game uh, for the 6502. And I thought first, no, use a game like this to test servers. But then I thought, no, this actually doesn't work well because it doesn't really stress the computer in terms of speed, in terms of uh, exercising the buses uh, with a lot of bandwidth. Because if it would run too fast, uh, it would be unplayable. A little game like this is unplayable if, uh, if, uh, if everything is moving around way too fast. So I thought this doesn't work uh, very well as a stress test. So I decided I was going to do something else. I decided to, to write um, a little bit of code in uh, 6502 assembly first. Uh, and this is the code here. Basically, this is a cellular automaton. Uh, specifically, this is a Wolfram's, uh, Wolfram's uh, Rule 30 Linear Cellular uh, Automaton. Uh, if you can do a search on this on Google, Rule 30 Cellular Automaton, and you can find more uh, about it. Um, but it doesn't involve player interaction. It just writes random patterns on this on the screen, random triangles on the screen. Um, yeah, let me compile it and, uh, and run, it, run it so you see uh, what it uh, looks like. Get the compile button active, uh, compile and run. So this is what it does, it just fills the screen scrolling horizontally, uh, or vertically, I mean scrolling vertically, uh, with these random patterns. There are some mathematical operations entailed, but the most important point um, is that uh, it, uh, it requires a lot of memory transactions constantly. Uh, the scrolling, the vertical scrolling is software based. Again, Cerberus does not have hardware scrolling. So each time the pattern is to move uh, one position up, every single character on the screen has to be explicitly read from one position and written into a higher position by the CPU itself. All 1200 character positions in Cerberus. Here there are less than 1200. This is a little online uh, emulator, assembler and emulator. Uh, this screen is 32 by 32. Uh, in Cerberus it's 40 by 30. I just wanted to show you first in the simulation so you, give an, you get an idea for how heavy this is to do. I mean, I'm running this on a, on a modern iMac. Um, and of course, this is Java-based emulation, so there is a lot of overhead. And that, that's why you see this a scrolling artifact, a sort of screen tearing. Uh, and that's why the pattern is evolving so slowly because of all the overhead and because the application requires some, some, uh, some performance uh, uh, to run correctly. Um, so this is very simple. It can run as fast as you can make it run, uh, even if the user 
supposedly couldn't see uh, what's on the screen so fast it scrolls, it would still be a valid test because it doesn't require <coughs> interaction. And we already tested uh, the interaction mechanism between CPU and keyboard uh, with that little typewriter program that we've discussed in several uh, of the previous uh, episodes. So I thought, okay, this, this, this works for my purposes. And then I went on and ported this little assembly code uh, to Cerberus uh, to see how it would do. So let's see if Cerberus is fast enough to do the vertical scrolling in a smooth, seamless way without tearing, without performance problems. Are you ready to see? Let's go. <laughs> there you go. It's way too fast. You can hardly see uh, the patterns on the screen. So we need to slow it down to see what's going on. I switched the clock speed now to 4 MHz instead of 8, and now we can see the patterns. They are still scrolling up quite fast, but it's possible now to check that the patterns are correct and the algorithm is working as it should. But to get to this, I had to correct a small error. I had to fine-tune something uh, in the logic of Spacer, the control nexus of Cerberus. And that had to do with the management of the BZ signal coming from the dual-ported memories. Remember, I was withdrawing the clock for the CPU if the BZ signal was active. Well, it turns out that there was a problem uh, doing that. Uh, very rarely, I would see an error, an incorrect write on the screen, so I had to dig into the documentation to find out why withdrawing the clock uh, wasn't a appropriate solution, and I did find out, and that's what I'm going to share with you now. If we take this application note here from Renesas, uh, which is the manufacturer of the SRAM, the dual-ported SRAM chips uh, I've been using, that's uh, application note uh, AN991, as you see in here. Uh, if we go down this application note, we see a diagram for the arbitration circuit that produces the busy signals. Here you have busy left and busy right. Each side of the dual-ported SRAM has its own busy signal. And if you look at this, the way it works, we have the address that's placed uh, on the bus on the left side and the address on the right side. And they go straight into these comparators without being gated by the write signal or the read-write signal. And what that means is when something is driving the address bus and putting an address in there, uh, these comparators kick in before the address values are actually stable. So these comparators in the beginning may be comparing addresses that are actually not valid. Uh, they may be in the process of changing. And the logic that flows from here on, and you see down here, uh, is purely combinational, which suggests that uh, when the addresses are not yet stable on the respective buses, uh, we may get spurious busy signals that are active when they are not supposed to be active. And in fact, if you go down, this application note, they discuss a number of things, and then there is this paragraph, how should I use the busy line? And if you read this, uh, it's remarkably relevant. The busy line's main purpose is to control simultaneous access conflicts that we knew. One design consideration of using the busy output is to make sure that you do not put an edge sensitive device on this output. Well, what am I putting on this output? I'm putting the clock input to a CPU. It is the ultimate edge sensitive device. <laughs> and then it proceeds to explain the busy output will be noisy during arbitration, which is exactly what I just discussed. It is therefore necessary that this output should be sampled after a valid TBA, TBAA and or TBAC and these values here, TBAA and TBAC, you get from the timing diagram of this part. The problem is that uh, um, it is impossible for me to determine when these minimal intervals have elapsed, when these times uh, are fulfilled. And the reason is that uh, the two sides uh, of the dual ported SRAMs uh, in Cerberus they are completely asynchronous. They run on two different oscillators of different frequencies, one at 25.175 MHz and the other at 16 MHz. So it is impossible to determine when is the correct moment to sample 
the busy signal because the two sides are asynchronous. If they were synchronous, I, I would know. So, well, it is impossible thus to solve this problem by sampling the busy signal at the correct time. So the only alternative option is to not use an edge sensitive device on this output. In other words, to not manage the busy signal by withdrawing a clock, because that's the ultimate edge sensitive device. Uh, and proceeds to say that, okay, after this time has elapsed, TBAA and TBAC, uh, this is the time at which the dual port guarantees a stable, busy output on the device. Prior to this, it is possible that this output is in a state of flux. Now, that's big, because this state of flux can create uh, uh, false clock transitions. It can create a, a positive clock transition when there was supposed to be none, and which may in fact make the CPU uh, go faster as opposed to waiting for the resolution of, of, of the contention and for the busy signal to go inactive. Let me explain this with a diagram. So suppose this is the CPU clock signal with its positive transition. So the clock is the clock ticks on each of these rising edges uh, of the clock. And suppose this is our busy signal coming from one of the dual ported memories and it's an active low signal which means that the signal is activated at this point here, at this falling edge of the signal. At this point here, uh, the signal is active. So the memories are busy, so we want to withdraw the clock at this point here. So how, how to do that? Well, straightforward way is to just end the clock with the busy signal. And in a simplified way, this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm using more terms because there are, there are, there are other things to take into account. But in essence, this is what I'm doing. I'm just ending the CPU clock with the busy signal. So under ordinary circumstances, we would get this. Because if you end anything with zero, you get zero regardless of what you started with. So that's the idea. Uh, the clock here is withdrawn here during this time for as long as the busy signal is active and it's active low. And then you might ask, well, but look at this clock period here. You sort of amputated <laughs> a part of the clock. The clock is now shorter. That shouldn't really be a problem. Uh, in, in situations where the duration of the pulse is so short as to be well below specifications, uh, then the CPU will simply not see the transition and it will wait until the next transition somewhere here. So it will just wait a little longer. I don't think this should be a problem. Theoretically, if the length of this pulse is just on the edge of specifications, theoretically you could have a situation where parts of the CPU would recognize the transition, recognize the clock pulse, and other parts wouldn't. And then in that case, you would really have a problem, but I, I don't think that happens. Anyway, this is what uh, uh, should ordinarily happen. But now we know that the busy signal can be in a state of flux before uh, it is actually stable. So it is stable at this point here, but before that point, it can have a spurious transition because the address bits on the two buses are not stable yet, so it may compute busy before it actually knows whether it should be busy or not. So this is the problem, this state of flux uh, of the busy signal before the addresses are stable. Now, what happens now if we just end this with that? Do you see it? Do you see what's going to happen? We will create an extra spurious clock pulse here. We will have this rising edge uh, which the CPU will interpret as a clock pulse. So instead of withdrawing the clock or having less clock transitions while the memory is busy, uh, we will add <laughs> a clock transition and the CPU will finish the writing process even earlier than it would without taking into account the busy signal. This is the problem. Now, you know, it, it's a pity that they did this dual ported memories uh, this way. It would be rather simple, I think, to, to just gate uh, the comparators with the read-write signal and start the comparison only when the write uh, becomes active because then you know the address bits are stable and you wouldn't have this situation here. 
But yeah, I'm sure those chip designers had a reason to do it this way, to not gate it uh, and allow for this state of flux. Maybe cost, maybe gate delay or signal propagation time, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they had some reasons, but now we have to deal with this. And to, the way to deal with this is to <laughs> not hang the clock from the BZ signal at all uh, and just use um, the regular uh, input pins of the respective CPUs to tell the CPUs that the system is not ready yet with the memory transaction in progress and that the CPUs uh, should halt. So here is the updated hardware description of Spacer to take uh, this into account. I'll take the opportunity and go through all of it uh, so you see the, the latest changes, the fine tuning I did after or, and during the stress testing. Uh, the pin declarations I will ignore, they are largely the same you've seen before. Uh, this is just the buffer enable, uh, it's set to 1 so it will be at 5 volts as soon as uh, the, the, the chip uh, is completely powered on and only then uh, the clock will be passed through. We've, we've discussed this before, this is to ensure that the power on reset feature of the CPLDs uh, is properly uh, enabled. Now here we have uh, the memory management logic. I moved things around a little bit, but in essence is what you've seen before. First, we compute the chip enables uh, of the four memories. So here we have the chip enable of the vi video memory, chip enable of the character memory, of the high memory, and of the low memory. And chip enables are active low, so the logic is inverted. Uh, but it, it basically just looks at uh, the bits on the address bus uh, to determine which memory then corresponds to the respective address uh, that is on the bus. And it will enable that one memory and disable the others. Now this is the read-write uh, uh, logic, uh, the read-write signal for the video memory, the read-write signal for the character memory, and the write enable for the high memory. Yeah, the syntax is different because these are different chips, so it, they expect different signals. Uh, but the semantics, the meaning of the signal is the same. Here is the write enable of the low memory. And then we have an output enable, which is common for both the, uh, the, the high memory, low memory, and the dual ported memories as well, uses the same output enable, if I recall correctly. Now, uh, these signals can be triggered by either of the three processors. Uh, it can be triggered by the read-write signal coming from CAT. It can be triggered by the read-write bus coming from the 6502, in which case it is ended with the clock of the 6502 to shorten the duration of the signal and avoid the spurious writes to a different address. Uh, and it can be the write signal from the Z80 uh, which is also active low and it's ended with the memory request uh, signal of the Z80 because this signal will go active only when uh, the address bus values that the Z80 is putting out are stable and only then the right uh, uh, bit uh, goes active. And of course we end everything uh, with the respective uh, chip enable because we don't want to activate a write for the video memory if the video memory is not the memory that is being addressed. So everything is ended uh, with the, the chip enable which is inverted because again chip enable is active low. So this is the read-write uh, logic. Um, this is the pause, and the pause is basically a processed version of the busy signal, uh, because the busy signal can be from the video memory or the character memory, uh, but we, on we want uh, that signal to pause or stop only the processor that is act actually trying to write to that memory, not the other processors. And that's why you have these equations here. I split them out in three different signals, a pause signal for CAT, pause for the 6502, and pause for the Z80. Before there was only one pause, overall pause, that could be triggered by any one of the three, and then I would process it further to identify which of the processors were, was uh, the relevant one. Uh, that alternative uses less gates, uh, but it's less didactical, so I thought I would just split them out in three and then everybody understands clearly what's going on here. Uh, for instance, cat will be paused only if there is a busy signal from the video memory and it is cat that is trying to write and it's the video memory that is being selected because if cat is writing to another memory then who cares what the busy signal is for the video memory. Or if the character memory is issuing a busy and it is the memory selected and it is cat that's trying to write to it. 
only in this circumstances here will cat be paused. And then the same applies for the other two, with the respective signals being used instead of the read-write for cat. That's basically that. Now, now we have the CPU control logic, and that's the update. Most of it you've seen before. Uh, but now the ready signal, what you've seen before, came until here. Uh, the ready signal for the 6502, uh, which is basically the system telling to the 6502, I am ready, so you can go ahead. So uh, um, when this signal is, is 1, uh, then the 6502 can go ahead, because the, the rest of the system is ready for it. But when this signal goes low, is pulled down, then the 6502 halts. And of course the 6502 will halt if it is not the CPU that has been selected, if it is the Z80, then the, CTU, the, the 6502 has to stay halted, or if the CPU is, uh, is uh, uh, not a go. So if CAT is the one that uh, is taking control of the bus and is not trying to run anything on the, on the CPUs, then the 6502 should remain uh, uh, halted. halted. So uh, it's only not halted when it is the CPU selected, when it is a go, and now this is the new term when it's not being paused, when this signal here is not active. And this signal, of course, is determined by the busy signal. So instead of withdrawing the clock, uh, I'm just now pulling the ready signal low to halt the CPU when the busy signal is active. Now, this one is not edge sensitive. If the busy signal is in a, is in a state of flux here, and it causes the pause to be in a state of flux as well, that's no problem. You may just halt the CPU a little earlier than you needed to, or for a little longer than you needed to, but you're not going to corrupt uh, the computations. Uh, this is not edge sensitive. So this is okay, this works very well, and it's with this logic here that you've seen the stress test being run before. Now, I saw, it so happens that I already had the ready signal wired up from the CPU into Spacer on the PCB. Uh, to do the same thing for the Z80, we would need this equation here. Uh, the weight for the Z80 uh, uh, is the same logic that you saw above, but it uses the pause uh, for the Z80. Um, the, the semantics of the weight is, is uh, opposite of the ready signal. This is when the system is ready, then the CPU can go, and this, uh, this is the weight. So when the weight is active, then the CPU should stop. So you see some difference uh, here in the way the signals are treated, but uh, the essence is the same. Uh, when pause Z80 is active, uh, the weight should go active as well, and, and it is an active low signal. Now, why is this commented out for now? Uh, the reason for that is um, in the PCB, uh, I had an extra pin left uh, on spacer, but instead of connecting it to the weight uh, uh, pin of the Z80, I connected it to the refresh pin of the Z80, which is useless. Uh, that, 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 that signal is only useful if you're using dynamic RAMs in the system, and I'm not, I'm using static RAMs. I don't know wh why I did that. I probably was hallucinating or I was s sleepy, I don't know. Um, uh, so I, I just wired the wrong signal uh, on the PCB. Um, it's not a problem, I'll just cut the trace and put a little bodge. Uh, the, the difference is uh, the weight signal is like two, uh, three or four pins before the refresh, which is the one I'm actually connecting. So if I had stopped that trace, you know, less than a centimeter earlier, <laughs> it would have been just right. No big deal. I'll just uh, cut it and put a bodge and I will correct this, of course, for, for the final version of the board, uh, including all the other improvements that we've discussed in previous episodes, all of them minor. So uh, if the bodge works, I know for sure that uh, the final board will work. I will populate one for me as well. I was not planning to, but I don't want my servers to have a bodge in it. You know, computers back in the day, uh, in the 80s, they all came from factories with bodges everywhere. So in, in principle, if that's my reference, <laughs> it should not be a problem that my servers has a bodge, but I don't like it. I don't, I don't find it clean. I, I will know the bodge is in there, even though it will be practically invisible. I will know it is in there. It will bother me. So I will populate uh, another final Cerberus for myself, and I will probably populate another four to give away 
to established, experienced programmers of Z80 and 6502 assembly who might be willing to write code for Cerberus, like a, a cross-assembler or a native assembler for both the Z80 and the 6502, an emulator for Cerberus, games, uh, other utilities. So uh, if you fit the bill, if you are an established programmer uh, with experience with the Z80 and 6502 assembly, uh, give me a shout on, on Twitter. I am uh, Attic, Attic V on Twitter or just do a search on the Byte Attic. Uh, give me a shout there and then we can discuss uh, if, you, if you qualify for getting a free, a fully built Cerberus to do some programming for it. Now the other signals are like we had discussed before. Um, Here is the clock management logic with the two-state counter playing the role of clock divider. We, we've discussed it before as well. And this is the logic for the three clocks, the clock for cat, the clock for the Z80, and the clock for the 6502. Uh, this is just an internal variable, raw CPU clock, uh, which just selects uh, which clock speed we are dealing with. Is it 4 MHz or is it uh, 8 MHz? Uh, 4 MHz will be given uh, by, by the state C1 of this little clock divider counter here, and 8 MHz will be given by state C0, and there is this in coming from cat, which selects which of the which of the options uh, is the chosen one, and, and therefore determine the clock speed for the CPUs. And this term here is then used down here and here. So I'm defining this term just not to have to repeat this uh, uh, redundantly here and here. It's just cleaner, more didactical. Uh, and the rest of the term is what you already know. The CPU only gets a clock when that CPU is selected and when cat says CPU go, you're free to go. Uh, and of course this signal is different depending on which CPU you are in. Uh, it's inverted when it's the 6502, then CPU select will be zero. And when it's supposed to be the Z80, then CPU select will be one and therefore it's not inverted. CPU go is the same in both cases. When it's one, then the CPU gets a clock. When it's zero, the CPU doesn't get a clock. And which clock it is, is determined by this term, which is basically a selection of which clock speed to use. Now, for the cat clock, I am still withdrawing the clock. Cat does not have a pin with a weight. Uh, I could build one, um, but I, I, I don't want to use a pin for that. Uh, because I know that this works for cat. You know, several episodes ago, uh, we've seen, you know, quite extensive testing uh, of this solution of withdrawing the clock to prevent uh, a miswrite uh, in the dual port memories. And as you might remember, it worked just fine. Now, why does it work for CAT and not for the CPUs? You know, because, because the write process, the memory write process for CAT is completely <laughs> different. Uh, uh, CAT is a serial processor, so it puts first the address on the address bus, which then triggers the, the, the respective uh, chip enable to select the memory. Uh, suppose it selects either the video memory or the character memory, and then it's one of these two terms. And then only several cycles later, the SCAT uh, pull the write signal low, activating a write. And then it takes several, <laughs> several cycles for it to deactivate the write, even though I'm doing this, activating and deactivating the write, on subsequent lines of code, one immediately after the other. So it's the short, shortest time possible to activate the write, and yet it's several cycles because of the nature of this microcontroller, the serial nature. So the write time is so long that even with those uh, you know, oscillations of the busy signal, whatever problem you can have there, an extra cycle when there shouldn't be one, it still stays there long enough to write into the right address the right data. So this works for CAT. I'll keep on using it. My reasoning for trying to use the same technique of stopping the clock uh, during the busy uh, uh, period also for the CPUs was that I thought it was didactical to have the same solution for all the three processors and since that was working for CAT I thought oh, I'll do the same thing for the other CPUs and then it's only one process only one technique for all three which is easier to understand yeah, now I had to break from that uh, you know, sense of didactical aesthetics <laughs> <laughs> because the solution doesn't work for the CPUs. On the other hand, you know, what I'm doing now, using the ready signal here 
and the weight signal for the Z80, uh, this is exactly what these signals were meant uh, to be used for. So it's didactical in that sense. I'm using those pins in those CPUs for exactly what they were meant to do, to halt uh, the CPU uh, in case the memory access was not yet complete, <laughs> to give the memory time to complete the access. So that's the story I'm telling myself now. It is still didactical, even though it's two different solutions, um, because I'm using the pins exactly for what they were meant. I'm happy with that story, I can sleep well, <laughs> so it's not a problem. And the rest is, is what you've seen before, that's the shift registers that translate the serial data coming from CAT, which is a serial controller, uh, into a parallel address and a parallel data word that can then uh, be used with the memories. We've discussed this ad nauseum before, there are no changes here, uh, it's the same. So this is it. This is Spacer now. The only change that is coming is that I will remove this comment here the moment I add uh, a bodge uh, to the board and port uh, this uh, uh, cellular automata application to Z8 assembly to do the same thing on the Z80, but with, with a twist. <laughs> and that twist, uh, you will get to know about it in the next episode. I'm not saying anything yet, but it's pretty cool uh, if it works. It will work and it's pretty cool. So uh, uh, stay tuned for that. <laughs> Now the last thing I want to share with you still in this episode, because I have used it in the stress test you're looking at right now, uh, is the hopefully final memory map of Cerberus, both functional and physical memory map. So let's have a look at that before we wrap up uh, this video. This is the final memory map of Cerberus, uh, hopefully. <laughs> I show two versions. Uh, one is a functional memory map, which basically lists the function of each address or each address area in memory. And the other one is a physical memory map, which shows which addresses corresponds to which of the four memory chips. There are two standard SRAM chips of 32 kilobytes each. Uh, that's the low RAM and the high RAM. In the high RAM, only 28 kilobytes are actually used. Then there are two dual-ported RAM chips uh, of 2 kilobytes uh, each. So that's physically what's going on. Now functionally, let's, let's start from the beginning. Uh, these are the addresses that you see here from 0 all the way to the top of the memory, which is address FFFF. All numbers are in hexadecimal uh, in this uh, slide. So the first three addresses which you see here, addresses 0, 1 and 2, uh, they play the role of a reset vector for the Z80. Now, the Z80 doesn't really have a reset vector. It always starts from address 0. That's where it fetches uh, its first instruction uh, from. But because the 6502 does have a reset vector and because I want to have a memory map that is more or less common to both CPUs, I decided to use address 202 and I will explain you shortly why as the start of the code area. And since the Z80 always start at address 0, then I implement a sort of pseudo reset vector there. I use these first three addresses that you see here uh, to store an instruction a jump instruction that will jump to address 202 in hexadecimal, which is exactly this, the start of the code area. In this way, both CPUs always start from the same address, so all the BIOS can just assume that code always starts from address 202, or whichever CPU is actually selected. And of course, this, this jump here takes uh, uh, three uh, bytes, because one is for the opcode itself, and then you need two bytes for the 16-bit address uh, that follows it. That's why the first three addresses are taken uh, to implement a pseudo uh, a reset vector for the Z80. Now, from that point on, as far as the Z Z80 is concerned, that's available memory. Um, but the 6502 has other conventions. For the 6502, uh, from address 0 to address FF, uh, we are in the zero page, and that's used as uh, for for uh, indexed indirect addressing in 6502 assembly. Now, if you are 6502 assembly programmer, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, 
don't worry if you want to program 6502s in assembly you will have to look at some other documentation to have a look at what uh, the zero page uh, means now this zero page cannot be relocated so the 6502 will always assume that it is in this area here the z80 can ignore it but if you are in 6502 mode you have to take this zero page into account um, within this zero page of the 6502 there is also the NMI serv service routine or the non-maskable interrupt service routine of the Z80. So again, the Z80 can ignore that this is the, the zero page and it will use these addresses here uh, as the addresses uh, um, for the uh, uh, non-maskable interrupt, interrupt service routine, which in the case of Cerberus is just a return from interrupt or a red N. Uh, uh, assembly instruction that takes two bytes so these two bytes are stored in address 66 and address uh, 67 in hexadecimal all right and then we get to the 6502's stack area which begins at address 100x and goes to 1ff X. And that's where the 6502 puts the stack, you know, the, the, the address space, the address space used for pushing and pulling or pushing and popping uh, things from the stack. This is also not relocatable. The 6502 is hardwired to use this address space here uh, for its own stack. So if you're programming in 6502 mode, you have to keep into account. You cannot put other uh, uh, instructions uh, in this part of the address space. If, on the other hand, you're programming in Z80 mode, then this is just available memory space for you to do whatever you want. Now, these two are special addresses for Cerberus. One uh, you've seen before, that's the Mayo box. When the user presses a key uh, on the keyboard, cat is the one that will be interrupted and, and acquire the ASCII value of the key that has been pressed. And then cat will take over the buses and store that ASCII value in address 201 in X. And then the CPU can go there and fetch that ASCII code. We've discussed it in previous episodes. Uh, what is new is this Mayo flag. And this can be useful uh, uh, for programs that do not to want to, to use a wait for interrupt instruction. In other words, programs that don't want to wait for the user to type on a key, like games. Games have to keep on processing uh, regardless of whether the user is uh, uh, pressing a key or not. But they do have to react when the user presses a key. So uh, in, in those situations, you're not going to use a wait for interrupt instruction. You don't want to wait, you want to keep on processing. So uh, um, what happens there is that the cat will still put the ASCII code in the mailbox in address 201, but it will also set this flag at one, uh, and this one will be stored in address 200. And I call it a mail flag because if there is a one stored in, in, in this address, it means that there is new mail, a new ASCII code waiting in the mailbox. If the CPU goes to the mail flag and finds that it's a zero or any other number except for one, uh, uh, then the CPU will know that whatever it will find in the mail box is what was already there before. It's not a new mail, so it doesn't need to react to it. The user hasn't pressed the key again. Uh, it's just the ASCII code of the previous key uh, that had been pressed. So this is the importance of the mail flag. If you're not using a wait for interrupt instruction, you have to have a way to know whether the contents of the mailbox in address 201 uh, are new or whether they are just what was there before and which the CPU program may have already taken into account. So this is why we have now the mail flag. Yeah, the, the metaphor is, you know, like old American mailboxes, mailboxes when the mailman puts mail in the mailbox, it, he raises the little red flag uh, to tell the owner of the house that uh, there is new mail. So it's the, the, same, the same metaphor uh, that's being used here, the same idea. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the start of the code area uh, is address 202 in X. So that's where the code starts. Uh, if you use a load file um, on Cerberus and you don't give an address, it will by default load the file, the binary file, uh, in address uh, 202. And then from address 202 all the way to address EFFF, 
we have the first contiguous large chunk of user memory or user memory block one. The user can do anything uh, in this space. It can put instructions, can store variables, uh, whatever the programmer wants to do. Now from F000 to F7FF, we have the character memory. This is where the character definitions are stored. A user program can change the contents of this address space in case the, the program needs to change the character definitions. And then finally, from F800 to FCAF, it's the video memory. So these contain uh, the token codes of the characters that are supposed to be displayed uh, on the screen. Now, immediately after the video memory at address FCB0, uh, I'm uh, assigning that to the 6502's non-maskable non interrupt routine, which is basically one instruction, return from interrupt. Um, you might ask, why are these two interrupt service routines so simple? Both of them only contain a return from interrupt. Well, the reason is if we have the mailbox and the mail flag, we don't need anything else than a return from interrupt in the interrupt service routine because the CPU can just check these two addresses here, 200 and 201, to see whether there is a, a new mail uh, and what that new mail is and react uh, appropriately. And that new mail, of course, would be uh, a key a user has pressed. So that's why these interrupt servi service routines are by default so small, but of course, Cer Cerberus is an open architecture. So if you have other ideas about how to do that, uh, you're certainly free to change this memory map. This is the default memory map. Cerberus will come uh, uh, from the quote factory or from GitHub uh, 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 set up to do what I'm explaining here. Now the remaining addresses in that physical dual ported memory, uh, this memory here, the remaining addresses in that memory, you know, physically they go from F800 to FFFF. So the remaining addresses after FCB1, FCB0, so from F FCB1 to FFF9, so not quite the remaining, uh, the, the very top addresses are used for, for another purpose, but the bulk of the rest of the dual ported memory serving as video memory becomes also user memory because uh, the screen is already filled if you use 1200 bytes. And since that memory has two kilobytes, you have uh, a little over 800 bytes free that uh, the programmer can use in you know, the second contiguous block of user memory, block two, uh, to do whatever the programmer wants, stores, store variables, indices, whatever. <laughs> now the top six addresses uh, uh, are reserved for the 6502's reset and interrupt vectors. This is also hardwired in the 6502. There's nothing we can do to relocate this somewhere else. They have to be in the top of the address space and therefore, per necessity, they will fall physically uh, into the dual ported uh, video uh, RAM. Now, uh, Cerberus only uses four of them uh, because in Cerberus there are no interrupt requests, there are only non-maskable interrupt requests, since it's much easier to deal with a non-maskable interrupt than with a regular interrupt. The non-maskable interrupt is edge-based, edge-triggered, so it's much easier for the hardware to manage a non-maskable interrupt than a regular interrupt that has to be cleared and requires a little more involved uh, protocol. In the case of Cerberus, there is no disadvantage in only using uh, non-maskable interrupts because one, they are simple and Cerberus is not going to run any real-time application uh, which has segments of code that really cannot be interrupted so, so they should be masked. Uh, Cerberus will not be using applications like that, will not be running applications like that. Cerberus is for demos and games, it's a, it's a didact didactical architecture so uh, it makes sense to only use the non-maskable interrupts because they are simpler to manage and we don't have any time critical uh, segments of code in it. And then it will also use uh, the reset vector. vector. So the contents of these two addresses here, uh, FFFC and FFFD, um, they will contain the address of the first uh, instruction of the program to be executed, uh, which as we talked about will be 202, this one here the start of the code area. So when the 6502 starts, it will look into these two addresses here, 
we'll fetch the address of the first instruction to execute and we'll go to address 201 to begin execution. So this, in a nutshell, is Cerberus's final, hopefully, <laughs> memory map. So this is it for this episode. There is still a lot more to come before we wrap it up, um, including a surprise in the next episode, which will hopefully allow me to demonstrate a little bit more the, the, the graphics capabilities uh, of Cerberus, even though I'm not really a programmer. I'll try to show a little bit of that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, uh, and I will see you uh, next time. Uh, until then, take care.